Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of Porous Media Tea Time Talk. Uh, it's the last session of this year, but uh, we'll be back early next year with a new season or new edition of PMTT. First of all, on the behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank all of the speakers and audience for making it a great experience. And hopefully everyone has found it useful. And I think a nice way to connect with researchers from porous media community. I would also like to thank uh, the Interpor organization for the help in promoting and highlighting our webinar series. And uh, I would also like to mention that this series is aligned with the geoscience and geoenergy webinar series which is hosted by Sebastian Hardy. You can find further details uh, in our featured channel. Um, as you can see uh, from the labels of our video, my name is Kamal Ji Singh. And today uh, in our studio, we have Catherine Spoon and Mohammad Nuraipur, Maya Rukar. Uh, unfortunately, Marcel and Tom couldn't join us today. I'll pass on to Catherine uh, for chairing the first session. Thank you. So our first speaker today is uh, Merdad, who did his BSc in Amir Kabir University of Technology in Iran and his MSc in the Technical University of Denmark. He started his PhD at ETH Zurich with a focus on visualization of pore scale processes in 3D printed porous media. And he defended his PhD just a couple of weeks ago. So congratulations for him for successfully uh, achieving his PhD. Um, this project is motivated by EGS, which is the Enhanced Geothermal System, that, it, uh, that aims at filling the knowledge gap in poor scale processes. So I shall pass over to Murdad now. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining my presentation today. And also the Porous Media T-Type uh, Time Organizing Committee. It's a great pleasure to be here to present uh, my work. Uh, which is uh, a part of uh, the work that I've done during my uh, PhD at ETH Zurich. Today, as the title explains, I'm going to talk about the experimental part of my study where we tried to visualize fluid flow and solute transport in uh, fractured force media. So uh, in subsurface applications, uh, with the motivation, of course, in subsurface applications, uh, force scale properties, fluid, and, uh, fluid flow and solid transport has been studied in uh, different scales, changing from nanometer scale to kilometer scales, where there is a hierarchy of information. Our understanding of uh, smaller scales can shed light on our understanding of larger scales. Here, of course, we are interested in the pore scale, which changes from a micro, few micrometers to few centimeters. Uh, pore scale has been a very attractive field of research because of its wide range of applications in different industries. There are various numerical uh, simulation methods and experimental methods as well for the sake of time. Of course, I can't go through all of them, but uh, I want to point out uh, some commonly employed uh, pores media which are used for experiments, which uh, can be, for example, uh, core plugs or uh, randomly packed bits. Uh, although these geometries has contributed, have contributed a lot to our understanding of uh, pore scale properties, they're associated with some limitations. For example, experiments uh, sometimes can't be replicated. The complexity is random, it can be engineered. And especially for uh, randomly packed bits, the manufacturing of uh, fractured pores media is uh, sometimes limited. But with the recent advances of uh, 3D printing, uh, researchers uh, are capable of uh, addressing some of these shortcomings. There are uh, plenty of uh, very interesting studies uh, where uh, pore scale properties in structured and unstructured medium have been uh, studied. However, uh, fractured pores media, we believe that require more attention. It has not been uh, studied enough and that's the reason that we use uh, 3d printing to manufacture a fractured porous media our medium uh, consisted of a low permeability matrix and a high permeability matrix which are constructed by an isotropic distribution of impermeable pillars as you can see here the permeability of these matrices are um, based on the pore sizes, which is the spacing between these uh, impermeable pillars. 
inside each of these uh, uh, matrices, we embed one dead end fracture and one flow through fracture. And once we could uh, make and uh, manufacture our 3D printed fractured force media, we uh, conducted two sets of uh, fluid flow visualization experiments, which are magnetic image, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, and particle image velocimetry, PIB experiments. For the sake of time, I'm not going to, through the technicalities. We can, of course, discuss it uh, in the QA session. But uh, as you can see, both of them are capable of visualizing fluid flow. As we expected, uh, velocity is higher in fractures and in, especially in flow through fractures. And then uh, both experiments are uh, in good agreement, although there are some uh, discrepancies in the uh, especially higher velocity regions. Here, uh, I want to especially show the PIV, particle image velocimetry, because of its high resolution, where we could, uh, first of all, visualize uh, velocity in the entire domain. But thanks to our very well-defined uh, geometry, we can look into different features individually. For example, we can study low, uh, poor scale properties here, velocity in flow through fractures and dead end fractures. And then, thanks to our high resolution, we can go more detailed and look at, for example, the, the interfacial behavior between fractures and matrices, as well as the, the flow, flow velocity inside the uh, porous media. When after uh, visualizing fluid flow, we uh, start. We studied uh, what we call hydraulic boundary conditions. Uh, and the application of uh, hydraulic boundary condition is for coupling of uh, flow in fractures and in matrices. In fractures, we, nor we solve fluid flow with normally Navier-Stokes or Stokes equation. In matrices, uh, of course, it's Darcy's equation. Coupling of these two uh, equations at the interface can be very complex. And that's why uh, two different boundary conditions are proposed. Here, we're going to talk about two well-known ones, which are Beavers and Yosef uh, velocity slip coefficient uh, alpha, and then uh, Whittaker coefficient beta, where they are calculated by the permeability of uh, matrices, the shear rate inside fracture, and also the shear rate inside matrices, as well as the velocity at the interface. And here is a magnified image. On the right, we have our fracture part. On the left, we have our matrices. And here, these blue squares are our impermeable pillars. And you can see how the velocity profile looks uh, in, at the interface. We then could calculate alpha and beta with the presented scheme for all the four fractures. Each fracture of, has two interfaces uh, with the surrounding matrices. So we could calculate alpha and beta for uh, eight interfaces. And on top of that, we were able to directly measure uh, velocity exchange between the fractures and matrices, which is based on the lateral velocity perpendicular to the flow direction velocity exactly at the interface. We believe that these uh, measurements can be used in uh, validation of numerical simulations and can contribute to our understanding of uh, the coupling between flow, uh, fractures and matrices. With that, uh, we started another round of uh, experiments where we studied solute transport with laser-induced fluorescence, uh, LIF experiment. In these experiments, we could inject either tracer dyes or deionized water into our fractured cross medium. We illuminate the system with a laser source and then capture images with our camera. These uh, tracer dyes get excited by absorbing the laser, and then they jump back to a lower energy level, which emits uh, a light uh, with a different color and with a lower energy. And the emission of the, in, uh, excuse me, the intensity of this emission uh, depends on various factors, such as laser power, for example, or quantum yield. But what's important here, which is also a variable is the concentration. So we are able to link the light intensity with concentration in our uh, LIF experiments. And that's, uh, these are uh, how uh, 
just uh, some videos of how our experiments look like. In the progression, we start injecting uh, tracer dyes into our medium, which is initially saturated with the ionized water. Afterwards, once the, once the system becomes fully saturated, we start injecting uh, the ionized water again to displace the tracer dyes. You can see how the light intensity changes, which uh, is an indication of uh, tracer concentration. In all these experiments, the idea of having a well-defined geometry uh, was to be able to uh, make conclusions quantitatively and qualitatively, meaning that here, uh, quantitatively, we calculate the uh, standard deviation of uh, tracer dyes uh, in flow and perpendicular to flow direction. And then we could see how the decrease of uh, standard deviation is related to a quant qualitative evolution of uh, uh, concentration in uh, fractures, in dead end fractures, and in the later stages. And uh, yes, I think I'm uh, going slightly over time. So with this, I want to conclude my presentations where we could uh, combine 3D printing with MRI and PIV for fluid flow visualization and 3D printing with LIF uh, for visualization of uh, solute transport. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I will be glad to uh, for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. The uh, presentation is now open for discussion. You can always post a comment uh, in, in our comment section. So if you have any questions, please write it down there and we will read it then to the speaker. In the meantime, I actually have a few questions. So sure. maybe maybe I, I just ask uh, start with, with the first one being, you mentioned at the beginning about the effect of molecular process. Uh, yeah, that, that the problem is a multiscale problem and that also molecular interactions may matter. To which extent is this a case? Or how do you think this impacts also when you construct a model with, with, with uh, 3D printing? Uh, so, uh, to me, uh, here, when we are talking about scale, uh, it's mainly about the resolution at which we are uh, resolving our properties. So it's either we get uh, our measurements in nanometer scale or micrometer scale or kilometer scale. Since our measurements and our geometry in, in general ranges between a few micrometers to uh, centimeters, then uh, this, this is more of a poor scale. Uh, and then it's not really a, a molecular scale problem, I believe. Okay, thanks. But I think this is also directly leading to the sec to the first question which we have from our audience, which is from Vita P. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. What is the smallest pole that was printed? Lowest diameter, for example. Yes. Uh, so here, the, the smallest uh, pore that we have is 200 microns or 0 0.2 millimeters, which, which is the spacing between two square pillars in the low permeability matrix. And the, the width or the depth of the, the geometry is also 300 micron or 0 0.3 uh, millimeter. Is it, is it the resolution with which you can get uh, with a printer or is it, did you choose them for a specific reason? Uh, it was to a large extent because of the technical limitation. By the time that we wanted to print our geometry, uh, we couldn't uh, go any smaller with the resolution. I think, uh, or from what, what I've read, uh, now there are uh, other 3D printing methods which are capable of uh, printing smaller scale uh, uh, pores. Uh, but we, we should always have in mind the overall size. So, for example, if it's a re really advanced uh, techniques, uh, we can maybe make pores up to nanometer uh, spacing, then it might not be feasible to have a uh, geometry with the size of uh, 80 times 100 millimeter. So I believe that now it's possible to go with the uh, smaller pores, pore sizes. Okay, thank you. There is one more question. 
from Hosseini Nasab. Where was the application of the study? Uh, so this this study is, uh, I, I I would say a fundamental study, and the motivation was for as I mentioned subsurface applications, uh, in specific as as Kathleen also uh, discussed for enhanced geothermal system which is a fractured coarse media, but we believe mm -hmm. that uh, the, our our measurements can be used to elevate our understanding of. Uh, any other pore scale uh, industry. So whenever we are dealing with fractured pores media, these measurements can be used to, to shed light on our understanding. Thank you very much. Then I would say, we have no, no, we have no more questions. Then I would say we go to our next talk. Thanks again for, for Mehdad for, for the nice presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, the next speaker is Tapomoi Batahajaje. And he is a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University, mentored by Professor Sujit Data. He completed his undergrad studies at Jadavpur University, India, and conducted his graduate work at the University of Florida, for which he received the award for outstanding doctoral thesis research in biological physics by the American Physical Society. Currently, he focuses on the understanding and controlling the behavior of bacterial populations. The floor is yours. You're muted. Uh, hi, I'm Tapa. I'm, my name is Tapa Moi. I go by Tapa. Uh, I'm a postdoc here at Princeton, and today I'll tell you about bacterial modeling in porous media. This work is mainly done at Professor Suji Dodo's lab with uh, Daniel and Jenna, both are grad students who focus on modeling bacterial chemotaxis in porous media. So when we start talking about bacteria, we are talking about something that we are studying for past 400 years. For Leeuwenhoek first reported about bacteria about in 1678 or something. So what that means is that over this large amount of time, what we have studied bacteria mainly in homogeneous materials, in liquid culture, in surface of soft agar substrates, these are all homogeneous material. But if you think about the places where bacteria live, the many physiological irrelevant situation and environmentally irrelevant situation, bacteria live in complex porous environment. For example, they live in our gut mucus, in our intertissue pores, in environment, they live in soil and sediments, subsurface formations. These are all complex porous environment. So for example, if you want to model how an infection spread through tissues or you want to develop an effective bioremediation strategy where a back where a population of bacteria will effectively um, navigate through soil and degrade a pollutant. The first thing we need to know how these bacteria are moving through such complex porous environment. Today, I'll tell you what we are doing to solve this problem because mainly it is extremely hard to know how these bacteria move through the spore space, and that is due to. Uh, the opaque nature of any porous media. So you cannot experimentally measure how they can diffuse through the system, what the bacterial flux is, and how pore scale confinement sets those. So what we have done, we have created transparent porous media by simply taking some hydrogel particles, swelling them in bacterial food so bacteria can live happily in this porous media, and we pack them really close to each other. Now, bacteria can uh, live inside this material and they can also migrate between the interhydrogel pore space. You can use a tracer particle, let the tracer particle move inside the pore space and you can image the overall structure of the pore and you can see the pore space is really tortuous. You can even track those tracer particles to measure the pore sizes and we found the pore sizes are exponentially distributed, much similar to any random porous media. So now we have a porous media where we can disperse cells and we can measure uh, the pore size. So the first thing we did, we dispersed bacteria and measured how uh, they move inside this material. And when we did so, we were completely blown away because it doesn't look like the cells are doing this traditional run and tumble motion that is uh, universally assumed for bacteria in homogeneous material. Instead, these uh, cells get trapped into this tight pore space inside this porous medium. They constantly reorient their body 
eventually they find a directed pathway where they can hop to the next trap. So they are hopping between traps. And what sense is this hopping and trapping? Turns out trap, uh, hops are set by pore space geometry. Cells hop when they find a directed pathway in the pore space. However, traps are set by both pore scale confinement and cellular activity. And we can model the system by uh, considering these traps or entropic traps. Now we can measure the hops and traps separately. What we are proposing is the long-term diffusivity of bacteria is not given by their run and tumble motion anymore. It should be given by the hop length square over tramp time because hops are when cells make most of the move and tramps are when they spend most of the time. And the, finally, what we did is we uh, injected the bolus of bacteria inside our porous medium and measured their macroscopic diffusivity. We have also predicted a diffusivity from our measured hop length and measured trap time. And we find that our measured diffusivity matches with our predicted diffusivity within a factor of three. So what that means is we can predict the long-term diffusivity of bacteria just by watching single cell motion in three dimension. Now the question is, uh, how relevant is this? Because, uh, you know, bacteria live as a population in porous media. Yes, they do also live as a single cell. Single cell diffusivity are important, but you also need to know how, what sets the bacterial flux inside porous medium. But how would you possibly create a dense population of bacteria deep inside porous media with the right size, right shape, and the right aspect ratio? That's a, that's a really tough job, right? Turns out, since our porous medium do have some cell-filling material property, we can 3D print inside this porous medium. And during my doctoral work, I have developed this 3D printing process where you can create any structure of any material inside this kind of porous medium. And uh, you can create similar structures with bacteria directly. And we start by making a cylinder of bacteria. If you look here, this cylinder is embedded inside a porous medium and you can, uh, you are actually looking at it from the top down. Each individual pixel here represent one bacterium. This overall field of view is about thousands of cell lengths. So if we watch it over time, I was expecting that these cells will basically diffuse. They will cover up the whole field of view. But instead, when we watched it, we found this. They're forming beautiful traveling waves. Let me remind you here, each individual pixel is a bacteria, bacterium here. So these bacteria are moving thousands of their body lengths collectively through this pore space. And you must be thinking, okay, since this process happens over about 15 hours, these cells are not actually motile, they're probably pushing their progenies forward. But if you zoom in in one of those traveling waves, you'll see the cells are actually motile. They're moving in random direction. However, the front moves at a constant speed at a constant direction, and the front speed is pretty low. And since we are collecting this data on a confocal microscope, we can uh, see this process from side and confirm that it's truly a one-dimensional uh, problem where a solid cylinder of bacteria expand as a hollow cylindrical shell. And we can collect this uh, data and we can azimuthally average this uh, fluorescent intensity to question how fast these uh, traveling waves are moving. And in fact, if we repeat this process at different pore sizes, uh, uh, we can change the pore size. So we can repeat this process at different pore sizes and we find that as we decrease the pore size, the traveling wave speed decreases. So what sets this uh, traveling wave? Why they, do they form? Bacteria are much like us, much like human. We go to a place, we uh, deplete the place out of its natural resources, and then we complain about it and we want to go to Mars. And similarly, bacteria uh, are, are nothing different. You know, uh, so Once we create this green population of bacteria, which is embedded inside this porous medium filled with orange nutrients, they start to eat their nutrients around them and they eventually set up their own nutrient gradient and chemotax towards their own nutrient gradient. So they are chemotaxing uh, their own nutrient gradient here. And since there is a clear separation between uh, of time and length scale between individual cell motion and the motion of the traveling waves, we can use a continuum scale formulation, uh, like a killer Siegel type reaction diffusion model to model our system. And uh, 
unlike traditional modeling, here uh, we are using our measured diffusivity in the system. And so we can question their chemotactic uh, traveling speed and chemotactic parameters. And we found that our uh, reaction diffusion model predicts, uh, qualitatively predicts the traveling wave formation. And if we repeat this process at three different uh, port sizes, we find that not only this modeling predicts this traveling wave formation, it also shows that this traveling wave is actually following the nutrient gradient. And finally, since we are imposing this uh, measured diffusivity in our model, we can question the chemotactic parameter or the chemotactic sensitivity of, uh, of, this, system, of this bacteria in porous media. Traditionally, this is thought to be an intrinsic parameter of bacteria, intrinsic property of bacteria, which you found that uh, in porous media, uh, chemotactic parameter is also pore size dependent. And finally, I wanna to talk to you about this movie one more time. If you look at this, the, the general question that comes to mind, how this seemingly random motion form this beautiful traveling waves. In other words, how chemotaxis even happening in porous media. And surely we didn't discover chemotaxis, but uh, chemotaxis is known for years and people have found that equally cells chemo can chemotax towards a more nutrient rich zone by simply elongating their runs towards a more nutrient rich zone. Can this happen in porous media? Can they elongate their hops? Our prediction is no, because hops are set by pore space geometry, so they cannot hop longer than the space available to them. And you might argue that they can truncate their hops in the opposite direction of the nutrient. And we think that is also not possible because we have found that uh, confinement suppress flagellar unbundling, so cells cannot stop their hop halfway through. And uh, to verify this, we have tracked individual cells at the leading edge of this propagating waves, we measured their hop lengths, and we found no directional bias of the hop length. So how these cells are actually chemotaxing? There exists another mechanism by which E. coli cells can chemotax in homogeneous liquid material. Um, they can move towards the more nutrient-rich zone by biasing their reorientation um, amplitude. So when they reorient, they reorient more towards the nutrient rate zone. So cells can actually do this by controlling the uh, number of flagella that are involved in the unbundling process. We think since cells cannot along this is probably the dominant and to verify this, we measured the probability uh, density of hopping at different direction, and you find that indeed cells are more probable to hop towards a more nutrient-rich zone. And to uh, verify the uh, relative contribution of these two uh, mechanisms, we have measured the chemotactic front speed from uh, the individual cell motion. And in this equation, if we replace the directionally dependent hop length by an average value, it does not change the overall front speed. However, if we replace the directional bias of the, uh, uh, of the hopping and by a uniform distribution, that completely changes the front, uh, chemotactic front speed, which confirms that the secondary mechanism of chemotaxis is the dominant mechanism of chemotaxis in porous media. So what we have found here, we found a new form of motility, which is hopping trapping motility, which is controlled by pore scale confinement and cellular activity. And we found that measuring hopping lengths and trapping duration, we can measure the long-term diffusivity. And we have found that confinement regulates, but do not suppress the chemotaxis. Uh, and chemotaxis in porous media occur by an isotropic orientation of cells. And with that, I would like to say thank you, and uh, I would love to take your questions. Thank you for a very interesting talk with some uh, fantastic videos, Tapa. Um, if anyone has any questions, please write them in the comments section and I shall uh, ask them. Um, I had a question. So you had the uh, predicted diffusivity at the beginning. And for this work, you did it with just one uh, fluid in the porous medium, right, for the bacteria to live yeah. in? Do you think it would be heavily impacted if you had a second fluid? Um, and how much do you Sorry, think so uh, how would you, uh, so what, if I had? If you had, say, like, another uh -huh. fluid in the porous medium, yeah. 
So, that, that, that you know, there are a lot of studies that uh, is the like extensive studies on like how uh, viscous fluid change, bacterial swimming, bacterial behavior. Um, here, we, we just wanted to see the effect of confinement. So uh, the porous uh, the media is filled with like li uh, liquid. It's basically water. It's water filled with like a bunch of salts. Now, uh, uh, to your point, if we replace it with some viscous fluid, like some polymer solution or glycerol or like, you know, some other viscous fluid, uh, then you have to couple the effect of the viscosity. But in other words, it only depends on how, on, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to change their trapping time. You have to think like, you know, um, cells are moving as fast as they can during their hops. That might also slow down. So you have to now take care, uh, take into account of like what the hopping time matters in the diffusivity calculation. So uh, in other words, you have to kind of like uh, incorporate and see like how important is hopping time relative to the trapping time. And if you say had water and air in your porous medium, do you think that would inhibit the direction more? So yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a very interesting talk and uh, thought. I mean, you know, uh, a real porous media, real soil do have some air trap in those things, right? And uh, currently, we are actually exploring that part. Is basically like trying to understand like how they navigate a uh, confinement and an air water interface simultaneously and people have done that uh and people have shown that like cells accumulate at certain locations but how individual cell motion get altered like in those kind of environment experimentally i it's it's a little bit challenging but i think uh we are going to find out pretty soon oh that's interesting um we have some questions now so the first one is uh was any stochastic modeling was there any stochastic modeling for this hopping? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I mentioned that we are modeling the trapping time as like entropic traps. I had just skimmed through the whole thing, but um, uh, in, it's very simply we are thinking that these uh, particles, they're like these cells are trapped into a pore space. There are many avenues they can take to get out of this trap. So you can think of there are bunch of configurations that this bacteria can take over time some of this configuration will take them out of the pore space and some of these configurations will uh keep them trapped in the pore space and if you think that uh this is kind of given like an rnes kind of process you can measure uh, you can get a trap time which should be um parallel distributed and when we measure our trap time distribution of these cells or the duration of uh, these cells spin in a trap and make a probability density distribution, we find those are also like power law distributed. So that's how we are uh, 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 saying that the, the competition between confinement and cellular activity kind of controls this, um, um, this trapping process in porous media. Okay, thank you. There's another question, which is, is the observed diffusivity of bacteria in porous media lower compared to the diffusivity of bacteria in the pore li pure liquid? Absolutely. Yes, it's a, a lower by almost like a factor of 50 or more. Um, so, uh, so, you know, traditionally it's thought that uh, uh, diffusivity is given by the run length, how much they can run over uh, runtime, you know, run length uh, squared over runtime. Uh, now, if you think about that, run lengths are order of like 60 micron over like few um, um, uh, milliseconds. Uh, sorry, a few seconds. And, and then you uh, measured the diffusivities order of magnitude higher than what we measured in porous medium. And usually it has been thought that cells still do move by run and tumble motion but their run lengths get shorter by constant interaction with the obstacles inside porous media. So if you, uh, if you wanna measure the diffusivity, the diffusivity should be given by shortened run length and the run time. And we found that if you make that assumption, the diffusivity you would predict in porous medium are also like an order of magnitude higher uh, than what we have measured. 
because like cells are not moving by run and tumble, they get uh, constantly trapped in the pore space. They have to constantly rearrange their body. They have to constantly find a directed hallway that they can move and find the next trap. Okay, thank you. I feel like Kamal, um, you want to ask yeah. a question? <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this fantastic talk, first of all. Yeah, yeah really fantastic, you. really enjoyed it. I've got a couple of general questions. They are more naive because uh, I'm not uh, from this field, to be honest. Uh, uh, in real porous media, although it's going to be difficult to visualize these things, uh, if you have some clay particles, and uh, what, what, what do you think is going to affect the, the migration or, or the collective behavior? Uh, any effects of clay and the charging of the clay on it on the moment? Uh -huh. So, uh, yes, uh, and, um, you know, there is always like charge interaction that might happen with the bacteria and the, uh, and the clay particles. That is possible because if your particles are positively charged, bacteria wall is negatively charged, there will be a columbic interaction there. So to avoid this for now, we just wanted to find the effect of confinement. We want to separate the effect of confinement from any other uh, uh, contributors. And we found that, so our particle also do have a charge on the surface. Instead positive, being positive, our particles are negatively charged. These are made from poly negatively charged polyelectrolyte. Uh, so uh, bacteria do, do not have like a, you know, attractive interaction between the particles and bacteria. Uh, but you are absolutely right. If you have like another Coulombic interaction, then you have to add an effect of like how these bacteria get uh, trapped on a surface, not even in a confinement. They get like attracted to the surface and remain trapped. But it's basically um, the same uh, idea that they, they are moving and they get trapped. And you can think of what drives this trapping. Either it drive, uh, is driven by the confinement or it can be driven by a surface interaction. But in the overall, like, you know, the physical model of, of like, you know, there is a short, um, fast motion uh, um, um, and then uh, followed by a long trap is, uh, I think is still gonna be there. Uh, just one quick one. Uh... The, if you have another dimension of temperature on it, uh, what's the effect on diffusivity and things like this could happen? Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. We actually did that work uh, in a. Mm -hmm. I didn't show it here. So what happens is that as you lower and lower. So uh, like I mentioned, actually, let me see if I can go back to that slide. Uh, I don't know if the slide is still off. Um, um, but so I'm trying to go back to this. Uh, like trapping model thing that we are talking about. So we have verified this. Uh, so here we are saying it's a competition between your confinement, which is C here, and activity, which is X here. So as you lower the temperature, since our porous media is ethermal, so what the, I mean, there is not much significant difference in the pore size or the pore size distribution. So the confinement remains the same, but you change the activity because the swimming speeds start to change as you lower um, the temperature and um, their metabolic activities start to change. So when you change the activity, what, uh, your, your bacteria get trapped way longer compared to when you um, have the uh, cells uh, you know, dispersed at regular room temperature. So your diffusivity start to like you know uh, decrease a little bit because of the temperature being increased and the activity being so you're trapping things for a longer time and since your um diffusivity is given by the hop length square of trap time the hop length changes a little bit too but uh sorry the hop length doesn't change ah, pardon my excuse me um because the hop lengths are uh four space dependent and you do not change the port space, but your trap time changes a little bit too uh, because of the activity. So uh, your diffusivity start to go down. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. I think it yeah. reminds me of one thing. 
uh, when you have drainage process, things can happen from throat and they jump straight where there's no point of like they can stop in between. But uh, that's a that's a different subject. Yeah, it just reminds me of similarity between this bacterial motion and our drainage processes. But thank yeah, you. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Yeah, there, this kind of like hopping and trapping happens in a lot of systems. And, uh, you know, one thing that can jumps out is like, you know, electron uh, moving through like different disordered uh, uh, energy landscape and stuff like that. Uh, and the same kind of argument holds there too. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you again, Tepper. We are running out of time. So I shall uh, wrap up the session. Um, this is the end of our talks in 2020. Um, so we will see you in 2021 when we resume with our Brazilian special. Um, so stay safe until then, and we will see you all on the 26th of January, 2021. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.